Hey, welcome back to the Hybrid Network, everybody, and another dive into Stephen King's classic horror novel, It, where we dissect and postulate on the intricacies of both the book and the 1990 miniseries in order to better prepare all of you for the upcoming adaptation hitting us in September of this year. I've talked at length about the book as well as the original miniseries, looking at aspects of both to instigate an interesting discussion with the rest of you fans out there, but there's an adaptation that I haven't mentioned at all. No, it's not official or anything like that, but it could be considered a precursor to the movie that we're getting this year. If you don't remember the official announcement, I don't actually blame you because it was really so long ago, but an IT movie had been in the process of being made as early as 2009, though the big name behind the project, Kerry Fukunaga, hadn't actually signed on with the film until 2012. He was set to direct the film along with co-writing the actual script alongside Chase Palmer, though as time wore on, those dreaded creative differences caused the director to split, stating that his vision for the movie wasn't lining up with what Warner Brothers wanted. In his words, he states, I was trying to make an unconventional horror film. It didn't fit into the algorithm of what they knew they could spend and make money back on based on not offending their standard genre audience. We invested years in so much anecdotal storytelling in it. Chase and I both put our childhood in that story, so our biggest fear was that they were going to take our script and bastardize it. So I'm actually thankful that they are going to rewrite the script. I wouldn't want them stealing our childhood memories and using that. I was honoring King's spirit of it, but I needed to update it. You know, it's always a shame to see a director walk away from a project, especially when that word creative differences shows up. It just invites all kinds of bad images of soured expressions and shouting executives. But that first draft is the subject of curiosity. What exactly would Fukunaga's movie have been like? Well, we have an answer. I don't think it was actually too long ago when Fukunaga's script managed to link online. I believe it was the day that the first trailer for Andre Muschietti's new version of the movie dropped, March 29th, when the leaked script for Fukunaga and Palmer's script went online. It's pretty hard to come by now, but luckily I managed to nab the script for myself, poring over it in the course of a night, unable to tear my eyes away. Rather than just give a story synopsis, I wanted to really talk about the key features of the script, going into what really would have made this version of King's story stand out, and maybe point out a few ways that it's being preserved in the new It movie, because just from the outset I can see a lot of similarities here. I would just like to warn everyone though that the following script has some particularly graphic moments. Anyone uncomfortable with large bouts of violence or implicit sexual actions might want to click out of the video now. That out of the way, let's dive on in. I guess I won't really waste anyone's time, so I'll start off with the main point, the actual story. It plays out pretty similarly to the novel, though there's a few big scenes from the book that seem to be cut from the script for whatever reason. Either they didn't work within the confines of Fukunaga and Palmer's more elevated and updated horror, or perhaps it just would have been cumbersome to include them. For instance, Eddie Kasprak's run-in with Pennywise is omitted entirely from the script, being reduced to only a mere mention of his encounter with the clown once the Losers Club escape into the old derelict house on 20. Niebolt Street, trying to escape the wrath of Henry Bowers and his group of punks after their apocalyptic rock fight. On another note, Patrick Hockstetter's fate has changed quite significantly within the confines of the story, actually dying to it and the children burnt alive in the Kitchener Ironworks tragedy, though this happens roughly 30 minutes into the film, as opposed to being eaten alive by a swarm of leeches in the book. Though to be fair, he's still eaten alive somewhat, so that's a plus? I think the biggest thing to take away about the Fukunaga and Palmer script is just how absent it is of any monstrous transformation of Pennywise. There's no mummies or werewolves or giant birds. Pennywise simply becomes things terrifying anybody growing up. This Dan Uris, who's undergoing his own crisis of manhood with his upcoming bar mitzvah, first encounters it as a naked woman in the mikvah of his synagogue, playing to his budding sexuality by touching herself in front of him, horrifying the young child before rushing off. A far cry from his encounter with it in the book, where he encounters a pair of drowned children at the standpipe. And it kind of goes on from here. Pennywise never takes on any sort of Hollywood monster form, but a lot of his tormenting of the children is based more so on inner fears, which doesn't sound that new when talking about it, but it's more that Pennywise doesn't become some fear of a popular figure, but he becomes things that scare the kids on a deeper level, becoming the physical embodiment of the kids' darkest inhibitions. You see, unlike in the novel where every kid has some sort of encounter with it, a few get left out and they more so just see glimpses of the clown as they learn more and more about the experience experiences of their friends, the main two being Ben Hanscom and Richie Tazier, which might seem random, but I suspect it's no coincidence that the two biggest 50s horror movie icons, a werewolf and a mummy, appear to these two and then they're taken out of the 
final product. These incidents might have just been a bit too poppy for the movie, and indeed, Muschietti even confirmed in an interview with Variety back in 2015 that there wouldn't be any werewolves or mummies in the new movie, so it looks like the lack of any Hollywood creatures is carrying over to the new film, though the scene in the house on 29 Nebel Street seems very, very indicative of it becoming some kind of creature. At any rate, it doesn't actually turn into anything truly otherworldly, at least until the very end. For those of you disappointed in the loser's final showdown with a giant spider in the book and in the TV movie, well, actually I honestly don't know how this will sit with you either, but honestly the way the scene is described seems pretty crazy in scope and presentation. Essentially, as the group makes their way down into the sewers, they discover its lair, which has the kids jump into waterfalls that fall up towards the ceiling where a large reflecting pool sits. And within that pool is something big. Something monstrous. Something starfishy. It appears in this movie as a much more Lovecraftian entity, being composed of tentacles and a giant orange eye, giving it the look of a starfish. And like the book, Stan falls victim to the entity's hypnotic gaze, its deadlight, something it refers to several times over the course of this fight. And any of you that are disappointed by the lack of spiders, fear not, because they do show up, only it's in a scene that's downright horrific in which they hide under a thin membranous floor, only to burst forth and devour Victor Chris in a terrifying display. After that, the movie plays out as you would expect, the losers manage to make it out on top, that scene is not present, thank god, and the group finds themselves back in Derry, making a blood oath to return to the town should it come back, assuredly setting up a sequel. Now, while what I've described here is pretty out there, a lot of this might actually play big parts in the movie that we're getting. Believe it or not, Pennywise's more Renaissance-era look is present in this script as well, and that whole Greywater scene that the MTV Movie and TV Awards gifted us with is almost word for word from this script. The repertoire between Eddie and Richie may be slightly updated, but the discovery of the shoe, worn by Dorsey Cohen in the script, and the group's inquiry as to whether their fellow classmate might still be around, needing help. The only difference is that in the script, this all takes place in the Barrens, while the movie clip seems to hint at them looking through the sewers, possibly figuring out that it lives down there already. Not only that, but the Geither of Blood and Beverly Sink, Pennywise lunging for Bill in a flooded basement, Travis Bowers finding a mysterious red balloon tied to his mailbox that almost surely has his father's knife inside, these all seem like slightly updated versions of scenes from this script. Keep in mind this is all the first draft of the script by Fukunaga and Palmer, dated March of 2014, and while I never got a chance to read the later rewritten drafts, needless to say the hearsay surrounding them is that they get a bit... excessive. But, with all of that out of the way, how do you think this movie would have fared compared to the one we'll be seeing in September? If you'd like to read the script, well, legally I can't actually give a link or a destination where I got the script, but I'll just say that it's not too hard to find with a Google search and some digging. But anyways, leave your thoughts down in the comments, and be sure to give us a thumbs up if you like this video, it really helps us out, and subscribe to the Hybrid Network to stay up to date on all of our videos as they come out. My name is Luke, and I'll catch you guys next time.